you. Um, something I haven't dwelt upon is that this is a fairly low budget uh, program. It's public television. Sometimes we can afford to fly a uh, guest in from faraway places, but often we have to be alert to uh, when they're going to be in town anyway, and then we grab them while they're here. Uh, my guest tonight is a, uh, a perfect example of this. Uh, when we heard that Elaine Stritch was going to be in town from London for a uh, Cole Porter <laughs> tribute at Lincoln Center, we uh, grabbed uh, as fast as we could. Elaine Stritch is one of those people uh, who made Broadway what it was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, on stage, in, in shows like Bus Stop, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Company, and off stage, she's a, an incredible character. She's ebullient, she's outspoken. Uh, she uh, admittedly had a drink now and then in the New York uh, Broadway scene, and she, she's a... Uh, nine years ago, she resettled, however, in London, and a lot of the... Uh, <laughs> a lot of the electricity went out of Broadway when she went over there. Um, I, I was at a party one time where she just came in like the Marx Brothers and the Ritz Brothers. And I saw the legendary stretch at her finest. Anyway, uh, in London, uh, she's uh, settled a bit. She's starred in various plays. She's become a, a top-rated television personality. She has gotten married and she has given up drinking. Now, none of these... Um, <clears throat> none of these unfortunate developments, I'm happy to report, have affected her humor. Uh, and s nor have they come near her joie de vivre. Um, no one knows where she keeps it, but she's certainly got it, as you will hear a little later in the song when she uh, lets loose with her singing style. Anyway, will you welcome, please, before I go on too long, the irrepressible, is she being repressed? Elaine Stritch. Hello. You know, I love the order that you put all those things that I've stopped and started. I, I didn't pay much attention to the well, order. Did I, did I, have the, them in... I did all the good stuff, and then you said stop drinking. I guess that's what was missing in my life, all those nice things. Oh, I... I mean, I was getting it uh, from a dry martini, and then all the real things in the world started to happen, so who needs a martini, right? Well, what, what is your philosophy on that? Since you brought it up, I didn't bring it I up. I didn't bring I, it I up. You wouldn't. came out here and just told everybody. I, <laughs> I don't see why I don't go home. I don't know. No, no you, that was a lovely introduction. I thought it... And I don't want to disappoint you. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do walk a little slower in London. You do? I do. I do. I feel, I feel that it's um, a much quieter, quieter kind of existence. And I, I, I like it because, oh, my God, the 20 years I spent in this town. I come you... back to this city, and it's just amazing. I mean, I was here in the 50s and the 60s and just before the... About seven, 1970, I left and went to, to live in yeah. London. I went with company. So company. that was a nice the entree. show company. Yes, the yeah. show. Oh, I went with company. With company I sounds like I went with a musical comedy that yeah. Hal Prince produced and directed, and and so it was a, a very nice plane ticket, I can tell you. And I had been there uh, in 1961 with Noel Coward in a musical, and I kind of fell in love with the country subconsciously, but I didn't do anything about it. And then I had work commitments back in America, so I came back. But it was always back there, someplace that I would like to live there. And my yeah. my mother's parents are from. Wales and my father's parents are from uh, Kerry in Ireland, so I didn't lick it See, off the ground. I think it's a little bit of. Does yeah. anybody know what that expression means? I, I don't, Before I get in big trouble, I don't know trouble. what that means at all. I'm almost afraid to ask. Uh, no, I didn't. Certainly, you've all heard that when when I someone don't. does something like their parents do, you say, "Well, she didn't lick that off the ground." Oh dear. <laughs> no, no one has ever heard that. <laughs> all right, next case. Wait a minute. Seriously, has anyone heard that, Hands? No, not a soul. No, no, no. Oh, thank you. Oh, there's thank someone. You. That's probably someone. Well, they company. say it a lot in England, I can tell you. <laughs> so there you are. Well, you haven't become stately and um, tedious, I can see. Oh, you no, no, become, no, no, no. No, no. It's just that it's, it's, it's the, England takes a little longer to get bad. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. it, they, they take a long time to, they're just kind of behind. They're li they do everything a little slower. I don't want that to sound negative, but I mean, no. it's just a, it's a pace that I like. Yeah. And I love the theater in England. And, I, and they like me. Let's not horse around here. <laughs> I mean, no, let's they really just do like tell you. the truth. Why in the world would you leave any place where they, uh, you know, where they like you? And I love the Queen and all that falderall and 
curtsying and going to command performances and all that. It's like a fairy book. It really is. It's lovely. Well, you're, you're the toast of the town there. Well, no, let's, for... not, let's not say that. They, uh, um, uh, the English people love Americans if mm -hmm. you level with them. You mustn't uh, try to fool them. You must be very straightforward in your humor and you must be very honest. And, and uh, they took to me because I guess my lack of inhibitions appealed to them because the English people are a little more inhibited than we are, I think. Can I smoke? I know it's terrible to smoke, but I, I've given up so many things. <laughs> you uh, have I, so... My theme song is They Can't Take That Away From Me. <laughs> I want to do a few of these a day. Does anybody mind? Well, I think you should indulge in whatever few vices you have left. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, of, that, of that sort. Why I you, have a compliment you for you. I have a compliment for you, and I think it's be, it would be good sense to tell you on your show. Well, it isn't I, uh, required, but <laughs> no. go right But I, um, I'm doing this Cole Porter thing, and yes. so I, you know, it's for charity, so you say to everybody you meet, well, are you going to come to the Cole Porter show because it's for charity? And they say, well, I went last year, and, and I told them I was in it, and they pay no attention to that at all. They say, right. well, I went last year, I, I don't think, and I say, Dick Cavett's going to tap dance, and the tickets just go. <laughs> I've mean, sold 12 tickets on the strength of your tap dance. You are going to tap dance. Me? Something. Tap? Aren't you dancing in the... I, I, I'm appearing in, in a number. And you're going to do and a little there, tap I think there are some steps involved. I see. Yeah. I see. Well, anyway, I just wanted to let you know that. But uh, you say, when you mentioned this, people sold their tickets? Mm -mm. No, Dick. You can't turn this around. It's impossible. I didn't follow that. You yes. said they went like that with their tickets. Uh, they bought them. Oh, I thought they you were throwing them. them. I told them. I, oh, I've got to tell this all over. You uh, all got it, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Why don't I explain it to Dick Cavett after the show? Yes. And we'll press on. I must have licked that off the ground. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very inelegant and yet expressive expression. Yeah, I, I, you, I, I think, you think I like about it. it a lot. I, I'm wondering what kind of digs you have. Uh, digs? Uh, digs you have over in... Uh, oh, digs. In, in, uh, oh, well, uh, my husband always says that whenever I tell anybody where we live, it costs him the dinner check. Um, we live at the Savoy Hotel. Have you all heard of the Savoy Hotel? Oh, yes. Is that the Savoy Hotel? The or? Savoy Hotel on the Strand in London. And yeah. Noel Coward introduced me to that hotel. And I lasted a week because it was very expensive. And then I, when I did his show over there, and then I got into digs, proper digs. I uh -huh. mean, improper digs. A flat, perhaps. That's right, something. a flat, perhaps. But um, I d went back to the Savoy when I went there in company. And they liked me. And... Um, uh, I do some publicity for the for the hotel because of the success of my series and if we ever mention a hotel on the series it's always a Savoy but I mean I love that hotel and they're very fond of me and we have a rate oh I see a very nice rate and one time an English uh, uh, newspaper man from the uh, in, in, um, the Daily Express in London was interviewing me and you know they all they, they talk a lot about money of course everybody talks about money these days but but uh, there's a lot of talk about money from interviewers they say to me how can you afford to live at the Savoy Hotel he was terribly British very British and I said I do the sixth and seventh floor rooms before I leave in the morning <laughs> and he wrote it down and right into the paper it went yeah. but they play everything straight over there you know he didn't get that as a joke at all yes you know I, I, I was put up there one time and um, they put me in a, a, some British television company was paying for it, a rate, I guess yeah. I must have had. And uh, the uh, bathroom, no, nothing in the bathroom worked. Oh, my goodness. And it was How the, long ago was this, And it this was day? the Chaplin suite. <laughs> <laughs> and the I Charlie joking, Chaplin suite. Yeah, and now whether he tried to flush his derby or what, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, here I was at the Savoy, this legendary hotel, but I, I had to go... In the I had to go down the hall, oh. so to speak. <laughs> Did they <laughs> knock a little off of your rate? They must have. I'll, get, I'll look ironic. into that as soon as I get back. But uh, uh, in that. hundreds of British films, it seems, uh, there's the scene in which the taxi pulls up in front of the Savoy. Oh, yes. Um, it's very elegant, and it's very old world, and they're trying to hold on to all the tradition. And, and I remember a marvelous story about the Savoy that almost was unbelievable. When I first stayed there, I had a button missing on my blouse, and so I put it on an ashtray. And I went out shopping, and I came back, and the maid had found the blouse and sewed the button on. I just couldn't believe it. That so that's is the nice. kind of... Sir, as a matter of fact, this is... Well, you say, uh, I don't want to plug anything. This is very sincere. <clears throat> I'm staying at a hotel in New York that really runs a close second is the Carlisle. Mm -hmm. And people ask me how I like New York this time, and I say it looks pretty good from the 
window at the Carlisle. We saved our money for a long time for this, and we just splurged, and I feel like Jackie Onassis. What? I really do. It's unbelievable to walk out on Madison Avenue, and somebody says, don't you think New York is getting scary? And I said, no, it's lovely where I am. <laughs> yeah, it's just terrific. But uh, we... What, what, what is your... Is your husband in the business? I, yes, I, my husband is an shook, actor. He shook he hands with him, but I didn't know. Yes, he's an actor. He's a very fine painter, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, does a bit of writing, yeah. and he's adorable. I really am very fond of him, and it took me 45 years to find him. <laughs> I, it's true, I got married at 45, and don't ask me how long I've been married, because that's the oldest trick in the world, <laughs> to find out everything. I met I John... I would be able to figure it out anyway, I'm very slow. I, I met John in Harold's show spot uh, when I was in bus stop. Briefly, I was going with Ben Gazzara, and they, somebody said, this is John Bay, and I said, how do you do? Could I have a Heineken's, please? Uh -huh. And... 22 years later, I married him in England. I think that's kind of romantic. And he said, I said, I said, no, wait a minute. I wait said, minute. if you're married to me now, didn't you have the slightest attraction for me in Harold's show spot? And he said, well, you were with Ben Gazzara, and I didn't want to get into that Italian thing. That's as though he, were. <laughs> he knew that Ben was a Sicilian, so he just said, how do you do? <laughs> 20, and waited. <laughs> 22, 22 years later, it all worked yes, out. Yes, and we met in a Tennessee Williams play in London. We did small craft warnings. Oh, yeah. And um, how did that go there? Because that, that had a mixed well. reception here, and it's one of those curious things that um, a play that does have have uh, sometimes will go a here. Tepid, and I... uh, reaction over here will yeah. will go as they say, like a bomb, yes. which means to go well. Yeah, it's the opposite meaning in London. When yeah. they say a show is a bomb, it means it's terrific. <laughs> Lynn, do you know? I am, I was shocked to find out. Speaking of money, yes, uh, what the actual fact is of how much people who work in England are taxed. And when you hear about um, all of these people who have moved out of that country mm -hmm. and, and had to take up homes in Ireland and Switzerland yes, and so on, yes. it's astounding the amount of tax. I know. I pay 100% uh, taxes to uh, Great Britain, the UK, and America. And we used to have a $25,000 allowance, like you didn't pay taxes until you, after $25,000. That's gone now. So I just look, I look at it with the, the philosophy is I'm paying the piper to live in the country that, that I really enjoy working mm -hmm. in. I, I love my country, number one, but I love to live in, in, in that country so far as my work is concerned. I like the pace and I like the theater and I like the fact that all the mediums are all there, the television, the, you know, the theater, you don't have to go on an airplane to do a movie. You can do everything in one town. Mm, it's yeah. very nice, very nice. <laughs> At the risk of, give, to, of getting serious for a moment, what did make you give up drinking? Well, I wish I was doing two shows with you because that's a whole half hour. Is it? Um, oh, sure. I, yeah. It's a week. <laughs> um, I, I, my drinking was overrated in this country. I was a kind of a person who had a wonderful time all my life. I did not have a superstar goal. I didn't wear blinders. I wanted to live my life. I didn't want to go home every night after my performance and prepare for the next one. I wanted to go out and meet people and talk to people. I had a wonderful life, and I was full of life, and still am, and joy and fun. And I think, to be honest uh, about myself, I think it was a little bit overdone about, oh, Elaine, you know, she's a live wire, and she kicks her heels up and all that yeah. nonsense. I did, but I was having a good time. And I think sometimes in the world, when you have a good time, people wonder why. You know, why is she having such a good time? She's talented, and I am talented. I'm not afraid to say that. But I'm talented, so she's talented, so she, should she have fun, too? I don't know whether that... Uh, she should have a yeah, good time and be talented. It's almost undemocratic to do That's both. right. And, of course, I stayed up too late, and I sat in P.J. Clark's till 5 o'clock in the morning, but, my God, I learned a lot. I can tell you. And I, I got a job uh, mm -hmm. through uh, booze once. In a way, I got a job with Peter Falk on his series. You remember the trials of O'Brien? Mm -hmm. A waiter came up. I met Peter Falk, and he was looking for some girl to play his secretary. And I met him in P.J. Clark, and he says, sit down. And I sat down, and he said, uh, what do you want to drink? And I said, uh, it was 4 o'clock in the morning, and I said, I'd like a double beef eater martini with a, a, a lemon twist and an olive and a floor plan. <laughs> and I got the job in the series, you see. That's just, just what he was looking for. Sure, just what he was looking for. But you didn't need the uh, drink to come up with that line. Uh, no, had I had it. one before I said the line. Oh, I see. <laughs> and what I, what I have found from not drinking, I've come full circle, which is something I always kind of secretly knew I would. Um, Dick, uh, a little bit serious, I, I, um, I got mad at myself. I got mad at myself because I found that I suddenly realized one day 
that drinking was a crutch. A little bit. And I think all those added things we have in life are a crutch. I was scared. I always, I'm writing a book, and I know in one chapter I say I was so frightened of everything, and the first time my father made me a whiskey sour, I silently said to myself, I have found a real friend here. Because the result yeah. of drinking the whiskey sour was so terrific. I just lost all my inhibitions, and I, you know, could talk at the dinner table, and I didn't let my older sisters upstage me, and I just was one, as full of life as one whiskey sour. So I thought, if that can do that, imagine what two would be like. <laughs> my God, I could be president, you see. So, and I, I promise you, everything that frightened me, I took a drink. Everything that frightened me, I had a drink. And it worked. I, st I don't want to uh, promote it, because, you know, that's bad news. You should find everything from your gut. You shouldn't have to find it from something like that. But, and I, as I started to say before, I said in my book, I, um, I drank everything that bored me and everything that interested me and everything that frightened me. And I hated school. And I put in my book that I passed Caesar on red wine and Cicero on white wine. Because it's really true. When I say, oh my God, I've got an exam, I take a bottle of wine up to my room and I drink it and, and learn like that. And As get a kid? It. I mean, in a... Well, 15. Well, you don't take Cicero at 7. In so. Well, quite a bit advanced school. Cicero this, this at 7. This was a con... Sunsets and blossom. No, really, it was when I was 15, 16, yeah. I had that whiskey sour. Now, yeah. And, but, but, why didn't you become uh, a, a booze-ridden hag? Well, because I was too smart for that. I used to sneak six months on, and not drink and, and get a lot of rest. I was a sneaky Pete about you things. Did that. Like, you did Because I had a wonderful feeling about self-preservation. I, really, I, I have a life wish, and I want to live, and I want to look good and everything. Well, it would, it would be too personal to ask if you, were you, in fact, alcoholic and anything? Well, uh, I stopped drinking through AA, and uh, let me hear, let, let everybody hear what I have to say now. That is the most glorious, glorious um, organization that I've ever come in contact. The, yeah. the people in AA are the kind of people I've been looking for all my life. They are selfless. They are just so unselfish and so caring that I almost died. I mean, it, was, it made it all dramatic and interesting uh -huh. to stop drinking. I will say right to this day that I'm not sure whether I'm an alcoholic or not. What I think I have done is stop drinking from my head because I was mad at myself that I had to depend on something to get my talent and my ability and all the good things I felt I had to offer. Mm -hmm. And I have been so happy since I cut it out and That's gotten great. such satisfaction. Then, two years later, I became a diabetic. And I thought I knew I shouldn't have stopped drinking. But I became a diabetic, and I was all ready for the doctor when he walked into the hospital room, and t he told me I had diabetes. And, um, you know, I associated that with you mustn't drink because it's full of sugar, liquor. And actually, it isn't. Uh, diabetics can have a little dry white wine or, you know, a little whiskey, as long as they don't have too much. But I was all ready to say, um, when he said no, I thought he was going to say nothing. And I was so proud because I'd been two years without a drink. And no, oh, he came in and said, now, if you drink, uh, Elaine, you can have it. I said, no, oh, I was so mad that I didn't have that moment of saying, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I don't drink it. You know, I, he robbed me of a moment. But um, um, I got along just fine. The only thing that frightened me about diabetes, it's a nuisance. It's an extra makeup case. And it frightened me a little because I had to inject myself. And I said to myself, I will never be able to do that. They gave you the willies. Huh? Yes, but I learned. And I, if we've got time, God, I'd love to tell you this. Every, uh, they sent a nurse in and to teach me how to inject myself. And I was practicing on oranges and lemons, you know, mm -hmm. for two weeks, and that got kind of boring. Terrified. I mean to tell you, I just said, I said to my husband, I've got to go to a home now. I, I can't do this. I've got, and John, my husband, is practicing on them, saying, oh, there's nothing to this. I can, and I was a, so, scared to death of him because he, I, you know, I want him to get it right in case I couldn't do it. All in all, I've gotten along pretty good, and I, I used to pack up a little brandy to come to a show like this, and now I pack up prunes and apricots and yogurt and my insulin and my needles and go to Mr. Vincent and have my hair done, and that's what I had to get, go through to get to you today, and I just have Marvelous. loved it, every minute of it. Well, I, I know. I think, we should, I think we should start the show now. All right. <laughs> there was a, a, a remarkable documentary. It's interesting in our business how one person's misfortune can be somebody else's good luck. Yes. And there isn't really time to go into all of this, but there was a, a, a legendary recording session where you worked so hard to get a song right. Oh, Aquarius, the uh, making of the company album, the making of the yeah. company album. 
Mm -hmm. uh, w women who lunch, was it? Here's to the ladies who lunch. It Here's really the ladies, was. The ladies who lunch. It took so long to get that number on a record so it would mean something, so it wouldn't be just a song. Mm -hmm. And when I saw it, Dick, I've never been so frightened in my life. It, you know, I didn't, you don't wear makeup to a recording session, do you? No, nobody sees you. Yeah. And so you, and you, you don't work hard. And then I realized that Penny Baker, the cameraman, had little walkie-talkies, and they're doing this film. Yeah, they were making a, a cinema document. verite documentary, I yeah. guess, of the... And I want to tell you, I scrubbed my face that morning in no makeup, and I went down there and tried to sing that song, and I always said I looked like I was Margaret Rutherford doing the life of Judy Garland. <laughs> Oh, it was terrible. But then it was nice at the end because I, it got to the point where I just could not get it, get it. I couldn't get it right. So yeah. Stephen Sunheim said to me, we won't do it tonight. We'll do it next Wednesday before the matinee and we'll lay a track under you. You, know, you all know what that means. I mean, you know, they put the sound in. Put the sound in. And then I was on my way to the Alvin to do the show, so my hair was all done and I had makeup on, so it was kind of a Pygmalion story. It was like before and after. And so, but oh my God, I look terrible. It's just awful what you go through in this business. And all of the, <laughs> and all of your, oh. all of your suffering made a wonderful documentary for the company that was making the film. Yeah. Can I say something Let, about you? Be quiet. Wait, it's time I'll, to go. I know. Oh, it's oh. all over. Oh, I just want to say one thing that I think it is so marvelous to have a man do a talk show that's really interested in the person that he's talking to, don't you? I really do. Well, thanks for what's her name. And, uh... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, you wonderful. I do love having you back. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night. <laughs>
But uh, uh, in that. hundreds of British films, it seems, uh, there's the scene in which the taxi pulls up in front of the Savoy. Oh, yes. Um, it's, it's very elegant, and it's very old world, and they're trying to hold on to all the tradition. And, and I remember a marvelous story about the Savoy that almost was unbelievable. When I first stayed there, I had a button missing on my blouse, and so I put it on an ashtray. And I went out shopping, and I came back, and the maid had found the blouse and sewed the button on. I just couldn't believe it. That so that's is the nice. kind of... Sir, as a matter of fact, this is... Well, you say, uh, I don't want to plug anything. This is very sincere. <clears throat> I'm staying at a hotel in New York that really runs a close second is the Carlisle. Mm -hmm. And people ask me how I like New York this time, and I say it looks pretty good from the window at the Carlisle. We saved our money for a long time for this, and we just splurge, and I feel like Jackie Onassis. Well, I really do. It's unbelievable to walk out on Madison Avenue, and somebody says, don't you think New York is getting scary? And I said, no, it's lovely where I am. <laughs> yeah, it's just terrific. But, uh, we, what, what is your, is your husband in the business? Yes, I, I, my husband is an shook, actor. He shook he hands with him, but I didn't know. Yes, he's an actor. He's a very fine painter, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, does a bit of writing, yeah. and he's adorable. Just I really am very fond of him, and it took me 45 years to find him. <laughs> I, it's true, I got married at 45, and then don't ask me how long I've been married, because that's the... Um, something I haven't dwelt upon is that this is a fairly low budget uh, program. It's public television. Sometimes we can afford to fly a uh, guest in from faraway places, but often we have to be alert to uh, when they're going to be in town anyway, and then we grab them while they're here. Uh, my guest tonight is a, uh, a perfect example of this. Uh, when we heard that Elaine Stritch was going to be in town from London for a uh, Cole Porter tribute at Lincoln Center, we uh, grabbed uh, as fast as we could. Elaine Stritch is one of those people uh, who made Broadway what it was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, on stage, in shows like Bus Stop, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Company, and off stage, she's a, an incredible character. She's ebullient, she's outspoken. Uh, she uh, admittedly had a drink now and then in the New York uh, Broadway scene, and she, she's a, uh, nine years ago, she resettled, however, in London, and a lot of the, uh, <laughs> a lot of the electricity went out of Broadway when she went over there. Um, I, I was at a party one time where she just came in like the Marx Brothers and the Ritz Brothers, and I saw the legendary stretch at her finest. Anyway, uh, in London, uh, she's uh, settled a bit. She's starred in various plays. She's become a, a top-rated television personality. She has gotten married, and she has given up drinking. Now, none of these, um, <clears throat> none of these unfortunate developments, I'm happy to report, have affected her humor, uh, and nor have they come near her joie de vivre. Um, no one knows where she keeps it, but she's certainly got it, as you will hear a little later in the song when she uh, lets loose with her singing style. Anyway, will you welcome, please? Parents do. You say, well, she didn't lick that off the ground. Oh, dear. <laughs> no, no one has ever heard that. <laughs> All right, next case. Wait a minute. Hey, seriously, has anyone heard that, Hands? No, not a soul. No, no, no. Oh, thank you. Oh, there's thank someone. You. That's probably someone. Well, they the say it a lot in England, I can tell you. <laughs> so there you are. Well, you haven't become stately and um, tedious, I can see. Oh, you no, no, become, no. No, no. It's just that it's, it's, it's England takes a little longer to get bad. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. it, they, they take a long time to... They're just kind of behind. They're li they do everything a little slower. I don't want that to sound negative, but I mean... No. It's just a, it's a pace that I like. Yeah. And I love the theater in England. And, I, and they like me. Let's not horse around here. <laughs> I mean, no, they let's really just do like tell you. the truth. Why in the world would you leave any place where they... Uh, you know, where they like it. And I love the Queen and all that falderall and curtsying and going to command performances and all that. It's like a fairy book. It really is. It's lovely. Well, you're, you're the toast of the town there. Well, no, let's, for... not, let's not say that. They, uh, um, uh, the English people love Americans, if mm -hmm. you level with them. You mustn't uh, try to fool them. You must be very straightforward in your humor, and you must be very honest. And, and uh, they took to me, because I guess... My lack of inhibitions appealed to them because the English people are a little more inhibited than we are, I think. And I smoke. I know it's terrible to smoke, but I, I've given up so many 
things. You uh, have I, so... My theme song is They Can't Take That Away From Me. <laughs> I want to do a few of these a day. Does anybody mind? Well, I think you should indulge in whatever few vices you have left. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, of, that, of that sort. I have a compliment for you. I have a compliment for you, and I think it's be, it would be good sense to tell you on your show. Well, it I, isn't uh, required, but <laughs> no. go right But I, um, I'm doing this Cole Porter thing, and yeah. so I, you know, it's for charity, so you say to everybody you meet, well, are you going to come to the Cole Porter show because it's for charity? And they say, well, I went last year, and, and I told them I was in it, and they pay no attention to that at all. They say, right. well, I went last year, I, I don't think, and I say, Dick Cavett's going to tap dance, and the tickets just go. <laughs> I mean, sold 12 tickets on the strength of your tap dance. You are going to tap dance. Me? Something. Tap? Aren't you dancing in the... I, I, I'm appearing in, in a number. And you're going to do a little there, tap I think there are some steps involved. I see. Yeah. I see. Well, anyway, I just wanted to let you know that. But uh, you say, when you mentioned this, people sold their tickets? Mm -mm. No, Dick. You can't turn this around. It's impossible. I didn't follow that. You yes. said they went like that with their tickets. Uh, they bought them. Oh, I thought they, they were throwing them. them. I told them. I, oh, I've got to tell this all over. You uh, all got it, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Why don't I explain it to Dick Cavett after the show? Yes. And we'll press on. I must have licked that off the ground. I don't know. <laughs> That's a very inelegant and yet expressive expression. Yeah, I, I, you, I, I think you think I like about it. it a lot. I, I'm wondering what kind of digs you have. Uh, digs? Uh, digs you have over in... Uh, oh, digs. In, in, uh, oh, well, I, my husband always says that whenever I tell anybody where we live, it costs him the dinner check. Um, we live at the Savoy Hotel. Have you all heard of the Savoy Hotel? Oh, yes. Is that the Savoy Hotel? The or? Savoy Hotel on the Strand in London. And yeah. Noel Coward introduced me to that hotel, and I lasted a week because it was very expensive. And then I, when I did his show over there, and then I got into digs, proper digs. I mean, uh -huh. improper a digs. A flat, perhaps. That's right, something. a flat, perhaps. But um, I d went back to the Savoy when I went there in company, and they liked me, and... Um, uh, I do some publicity for the for the hotel because of the success of my series and if we ever mention a hotel on the series it's always a Savoy but I mean I love that hotel and they're very fond of me and we have a rate oh I see a very nice rate and one time an English uh, uh, newspaper man from the uh, in, in, um, the Daily Express in London was interviewing me and you know they all they, they talk a lot about money of course everybody talks about money these days but but uh, there's a lot of talk about money from interviewers they say to me how can you afford to live at the Savoy Hotel he was terribly British very British and I said I do the sixth and seventh floor rooms before I leave in the morning <laughs> and he wrote it